Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. In fact, I, I can't really think of a, a more wonderful place to be in the world right now than this extraordinary city uh, in the heart of Europe and with educators. I have spent my entire career as an educator, and it's thrilling for me uh, to be here with this community of change makers. And I wish you uh, a very, very successful two days. So I began uh, this work in 1990 when I went uh, to a village. This is the village, the village of Mola. This is where the story begins. It's on the western side of Zimbabwe, in a place called Nyami Nyami. And this village was moved to this community, to this land, when the Kariba Dam was built in 1956. At that time, there were 57,000 people living in the Zambezi Valley. And they were in the wrong place at the wrong time because the colonial authorities wanted the, the land, wanted the uh, land around to be uh, new, uh, power, you know, rich agricultural land. They wanted fisheries. So this was a big new economic advance for um, the colony, uh, southern Rhodesia at that time. And so 57,000 people were given the choice, move or drown. They lost everything under the waters of the lake. And that began a time of deep trauma because not only did they have everything taken from them, now taxes were imposed, hut taxes, dog taxes, anything that could be taxed because the colonial authority wanted them to work as poorly paid laborers in the new farms and fisheries. So I went in 1990, 10 years after Southern Rhodesia had become, of course, Zimbabwe, an independent nation, Huge enthusiasm for education, massive investment in education at that time, almost 30% of the national purse being spent on education. And of course, I come from Britain, and there was this uh, idealized view of southern Rhodesia as a former colony, as a place uh, where everyone had been uh, very happy and secure. Of course, uh, a pack of lies, and in fact, uh, there were only 60 places for every thousand black children in a racialized, segregated education system. And uh, one of the struggles for independence was motivated by the desire for education, that the national universal des desire for education in Zimbabwe at that time. And so this community of Mola, which was on the edge, I went there because it was the poorest place, and in spite of this massive investment, so that after 10 years, there were 600 places for every 1,000 children in a desegregated system, in spite of that, the majority of those outside the school system were girls. And I went to understand the reasons why. Now, the prevailing view was that girls, and this is not a, a selected um, generic photograph. This was a photograph of a child in that community, a girl. And you can see the level of poverty. And this poverty is not untypical. The reality was that girls were outnumbered in the secondary school system in Mola by seven to one. And here I think I want to return to your story of the cow, because these cows are indeed everywhere. It wasn't the issue of the cow in the village, it was the issue of the cow in the industry, in the international development industry, which had decided that girls weren't at school because of resistance to the education of girls, that this indeed was a cultural issue. Somehow the issue of poverty was not mentioned. Cultural attitudes, traditional values, papers, extensive papers, conferences on why, why won't these people send their daughters to school? The implication being, of course, that they were too stupid to understand the impact of girls' education on child health, on maternal mortality, on population growth, on family security. If you look at the rationale, and there is always a rationale for people's decisions, Boys had a much better chance of paid work. They could go to the cities, they were safer there, 
and they could bring money back to the family. In what was becoming, of course, a cash economy now, you paid for education, not at primary school level, but at secondary school level. You paid uh, for health care. So at the point of those services, poor people needed cash. And they didn't have it because they were subsistence farmers. How to get money into the family when the wider environment favors boys and boys' education? So I went back um, to talk about this cow and the fact that what I'd found was this rationale. Because money was being spent on persuasion, on trying to persuade poor parents to send their daughters to school. I pointed out the irony of TV adverts when people had no electricity, no television sets. Um, what was the purpose? Some people who did have television sets and electricity were indeed sending their daughters to school. I talked about the irony of posters to parents who were non-literate, who had been denied education in the colonial period. But it fell on deaf ears. I was a novice. I was studying a subject, and I was new to it. But I was deeply shocked by the resistance, and I continued to meet that resistance. Perhaps I should move, move here. I continued to meet uh, that resistance in uh, international agencies and in, um, in governments. But in the community, people were saying, Yes, we want our daughters to go to school. So I returned, because the only way I was going to be able to demonstrate the, the truth of what people were saying was to set up a program. I had absolutely not intended to do so. So I began a program with 32 girls. It was a personal initiative. My husband and I, we funded it, we started it. And it began with that small number. One of those 32 girls is now Raniuaro Matungaidzi, a pediatrician in Angola from a deeply impoverished rural family. She is now in her mid-30s with two children of her own married to a pharmacist. She was one of the 32 who had no opportunity whatsoever to continue with her education. And we grew from that 32 1.6 million children benefiting in 2015 in terms of access to primary and secondary school education, tertiary level education, professional training, or business opportunities. We have looked at the whole spectrum of education and we have grown up as an organization as the young women themselves have grown up with us. So how? Well, given the resistance uh, in the agencies and indeed in, in uh, foreign governments, including my own, to the very idea of investment in girls' education in terms of the families, the resources were not forthcoming. But the resources, of course, were there. Where were they? They were in the community. This became a highly democratic, community-based initiative. I went back to the chief of the village and I said, I'm here. And he said, I didn't think you were coming back. You have grown stout. Oh dear, I said. Anyway, that was, that was the beginning of, of a wonderful relationship in terms of the traditional system of that community and indeed beyond getting behind this initiative for girls' education. The resistance wasn't there. So that we looked, started to look in terms of the, the capital, the different forms of capital that were available now to support an initiative for girls' education. The social capital, the parents. The parents who were viewed as being uninterested because they didn't come to the school for parent meetings. Why didn't they come to the school for parent meetings? They didn't come because they were intimidated. They hadn't been to school themselves. They were embarrassed about their clothes. They were embarrassed about their inability to speak English. They simply did not have the confidence to walk over the threshold. How many of us 
work in communities where parents are blamed for their lack of interest in their children's education? What are the reasons for their absence from the school? Even those uh, in Europe, in my country, I worked in a very poor area of London. They didn't come because they had failed school. Schools had, in fact, failed them. So they were embarrassed to come into an institution that intimidated them. Absolutely fundamental. And the parents working with us began to change their practices at home. We said, how can a girl be expected to succeed if she does not have uh, time to study, if she's the one collecting water, if she's the one uh, you know, helping her mother cook? She needs time to study. Change the practice at home so that boys too are included in the domestic life of the family. So gradually, more and more parents came to an understanding. We taught how to understand an exercise book that a tick actually was a positive and a cross less so. They couldn't understand the symbolism of exercise books because they couldn't read. And there was palpable energy and enthusiasm for their children's education when they, of course, had had none. The knowledge capital, where does the understanding, the deepest, where are our deepest allies, our greatest allies for change? Where are our greatest allies for transformation? I believe that they're the people who understand the problem because they live it. And of course, they tend to be excluded from the policy table, from the discussions. The interpretation is imposed upon them, what outsiders come and what they think they see. The re issue around girls' education was, was so uh, deeply flawed, the, the, the knowledge base, the, uh, the, the, the research was so deeply flawed because they were so based on observational studies. Even feminist literature was saying, no, girls can't go to school because their mothers need them at home. My position was, give a mother the choice. Don't make the choice on her behalf. What mother wouldn't do more in the household in order that her daughter has the opportunity? But the choices were being made on their behalf. Infantilizing the poor, infantilizing people who were in fact at the heart of the problem that needed to be changed. So Camford's success has very much grown and been built on a dialogue in communities, on a dialogue with the people who know and understand, and with a sharing of that dialogue with those in a, power, in, in a position of power to change things. And as our information, our database has grown, so we are now uh, in a p powerful position to affect policy change. We are advising the British government. We are advising USAID. We are working with the Brookings Institute. We are working globally with those institutions that have resources to create change because the problem is acute. 75 girls in sub-Saharan Africa complete primary school education, eight complete secondary school education. How can countries build from that very low base of education of their, of their women, of their girls and of their women? We will see a continuation. We will see the sustaining of poverty, of maternal health, of maternal of poor health, of maternal death, of child, child poor health, of insecurity in the family. This is, there is an imperative about this investment. But how do we create those kinds of structures that will sustain a momentum going forward? So one of the things that Camfer did was build, build institutions. In the case of education, in that village in Mola, I sat for a day while the community discussed how to move forward, how to make a selection of girls, what would be the criteria. I was a bystander in that. They came up with the answers. And one of the answers they came up with was that there should be a committee. And that that committee in the community should not be solely based in the school. It should not be solely the educators. But someone said, the education of the child is the responsibility of everyone. And on that basis, 
All those with the power to effect change in a girl's life were brought together in a committee. And that has been one of the most powerful uh, parts of, of the model of Camford going forward into five countries, into almost 6,000 communities in sub-Saharan Africa. That first principle of the democratic nature of a community, bringing those, those power brokers together, bringing those constituencies together, welfare, health, traditional leaders, religious institutions, and the educators is what has given this huge strength. But what, what of then those who make it through in, in increasing numbers? I went to the United States, uh, States of the World uh, Women's Conference that was hosted by uh, Michelle Obama, indeed initiated by Michelle Obama a few months ago. And I did some research uh, on the American education system before I left. In many areas of Appalachia, almost 50% of children are growing up below the poverty line. And the poverty line is set low. What happens, of course, uh, and uh, there's been, I think it's J.D. Vance has written a book about um, his path from Appalachia. What happens is that those individuals who make it in small numbers against the odds leave. They leave their communities. What we saw as the problem was the fact that you had this constant brain drain of educated young people going to the cities in search of work, taking their knowledge with them, taking their entrepreneurship with them. And that meant that, yes, they would send remittances back to the community, but nothing was changing in terms of the socioeconomic base of that community. So we said, we need a critical mass of girls to move through the education system, and we need to be able to create the structures through which they can mobilize, through which they can express their own agency, through which they can become the change makers, and that they have a community of change makers that they belong to. So we created CAMA. CAMA is the alumni of all those who go through the program. When CAMA was founded in 1998, when the first cohort of girls were coming through the secondary school education system of Camford, that moment was extremely important and powerful. I would say it was the greatest milestone of the organization because what that did was draw together all these young women, give them a voice, give them a platform, and crucially, give them an institutional framework within which to work. Building institutions is absolutely vital, I believe, in the process of change and transformation, and building those institutions at the heart of the problem. CAMA is projected to grow, as, of course, we increasingly bring girls through the secondary school education system. And they are, in fact, leading our work in Africa now. They themselves, through their own efforts, through their own uh, employment, are supporting the education of 123,379 children. The number this year, of course, will have grown. Just think about that, those 32 girls that began. We did not in any way superimpose this idea on CAMA that they should be the new generation of philanthropists. It was their experience of lived poverty with the transformative power of education that mobilized them to do this. Because their empathy doesn't need to be taught on any curriculum. They have that empathy, they have that power because of their experience. I think that this model can resonate and has implications for many other parts um, of, um, of the world, many of our communities, because it is putting power into the hands of those who've grown and lived through the problems of poverty. They understand it deeply because they've lived it and they care. So when these young women get into positions of power, this is Ruka Diliman from northern Ghana. She looks, as you can see, well, uh, confident, outgoing. 
She was also a child once from a very poor family who struggled um, you know, to, to even get through primary school until she got support. And she is actually one of uh, President Obama's young African leaders, was um, honored in Washington, D.C., and won one of the prizes of $25,000 to invest in her chicken poultry business, which has now expanded. Because what she saw was the trucks coming up from the south of Ghana to the north, and of course, refrigerated trucks with all the meat and the poultry. When they get to northern Ghana, the electricity supply is inadequate. Well, you know what happens when chickens are frosted and defrosted. There was a huge amount of, of, of food poisoning. She took this issue on, and she now has a thriving uh, poultry business, um, which supplies um, fresh poultry uh, to um, a large number of communities. I spoke about Rinyarara Machingaidzi a little earlier, one of the first 32 from Zimbabwe. Rinyarara, this is her at work. She said to me, when I'm at the hospital, this is in Angola, and I see a nurse speaking unkindly to a woman, I say, don't speak to that woman that way, she could be my mother. And she said, the nurses are shocked because they don't think a doctor comes from a poor rural community. She's a change maker, not only because of her professional uh, role uh, as a healer, but as a healer within the uh, institution itself and as a mediator within the institution itself. This is Abigail Kayindu. Abigail is from Zambia. And Abigail is uh, one of the advisors, the young advisors to Ban Ki-moon uh, on his uh, UN initiative for youth. Again, uh, brought up by her grandmother, uh, Abigail, an orphan child, uh, really desperate situation. And uh, when she leaves uh, for the United States, the whole community comes out to celebrate. So these are just a few of the CAMA members. We um, will actually have, uh, by the end of the year, but the projections are that we will have around 62,000 CAMA members young women, all from backgrounds of deep rural poverty across five countries of rural Africa, who are now, many of them on the world stage, arguing for change. So I like to think of them as being part of this community, of the community here today, part of the um, community of educators. And I hope that one day one of them will actually be addressing you as I am, because my first event when I launched CAMFED uh, in London was called Speaking for Ourselves. They are speaking for themselves now, and I hope, as I say, one day they will speak to you. Thank you so much.